and welcome back to this series of Is It Love or? Today we're going to be talking about grooming and once again, Charmaine is here with me and we're going to discuss uh, grooming and denial. So welcome back, Charmaine. It's so great to be back with you. Okay, so today we're going to spotlight how does a how does an amazing initial dating period where there's all this love and affection and attention and flattering and it feels so amazing, how does it transition from that to an abusive relationship? So the purpose of this particular uh, episode and what we're gonna and this conversation is about how does that happen? What are those little signs? Because it typically does not happen all of a sudden. And that's the reason people end up in these relationships and end up in denial because they always go back to that first phase of how wonderful it was and hoping that it goes back to that. So, Charmaine, I'm going to hand it over to you. What is one of the signs that you like to kind of spotlight in regards to the grooming phase from the loving, love bombing to the abuse? So for me, there wasn't, uh, there weren't many gifts Actually, there were barely any gifts, but um, the love came in forms of support. Like he was always a phone call away or he was, he was right there whenever I needed him. And that was something I really wanted in someone, you know, like if I need someone, he's always there. He's always supportive. And I got that. I got that with him. It was amazing. I had a slight mishap and he was there. I was sick and there was no one else. My dad was out of town and he was there to take me to the hospital. And it was just these little things that made me feel that he was so perfect. And then as um, we progressed with our dating, bit by bit, the support kind of disappeared. So he kept chipping away the support little by little. And then I, then it started with um, not keeping in touch with friends and, you know, saying things like, oh, when we're together, there's no need for space. And in my head, I was like, oh, no, we do need space. And then he was like, no, but when there's love, there's no need for space. And it, I didn't look at that red flag at that time, but that was a pretty huge red flag when they say something like, oh, when, when there's love, there's no need for space. Everybody needs space. And initially, I was starting to get suffocated, but I ignored that. And I was like, yeah, maybe he's right because I didn't have that kind of relationship before where, you know, there was so much love in the beginning or illusion of love. It was more of an illusion because when everything finally gets chipped away, you're left with nothing but an illusion. And it, you're just so confused. And, you know, there's like, which way do I turn sort of? So this support kind of gets chipped away when, and suddenly you're your own um, emotional support. You're your own support system because your friends, you've kind of distanced yourself from your friends. You don't, you don't want them to know like what's really happening with you. And you're alone. Yeah, and you feel like and it's, it's your fault. It feels like that you, you maybe you did something to to make that happen, and you start blaming yourself, right? Yeah, yeah. That is one big thing I I kind of ignored. Mm -hmm. And on that point, my, my experience, and I know like, we, we're sharing our experiences here. Uh, in this series because it's the experience of many so it's not here because we just want to dump <laughs> what we've been through but it's just to show that this happens to a lot of different people and in my experience the the transition was from like you're you're the best thing ever and then actually that was always there i i treat you like a queen that was always there, but there was the undermining underneath. But the the one thing is kind of like yours, like not really having a lot of space by yourself, constantly checking on me, like that continued. 
uh, it started as a nice thing, right? Like kind of, oh, just, oh, you know, the person really cares. And then, then it's really checking up on you just to see every move and who you're with, what are you doing? When are you going to be home? That constantly. And why aren't you home yet? Um, so that those little things, it just kind of transitioned from what seemed to be just loving and caring to kind of more of a control, but it happened gradually. But also every time we were invited by friends, it was always, no, um, no, we, we, we need to spend time. Like we, we need, we need to be on our own. We need to spend more time together. And it was always turning down friends to the point that friends stopped inviting. Right. So then you find yourself really with not any friends around because you've alienated everyone because every time they invite you <laughs> you're not you know you're always saying no so eventually they stop inviting you uh so that that was uh that was one of my experiences there were a lot of a lot of different signs but one of the parts that um along the same line of transitioning grooming part into keeping you there is that message that comes on, on you know that the sub message that is weaved in that I can't live without you without you I'm nothing if you ever left me I'll kill myself those um kind of things that keep you <laughs> now you feel responsible for the other person kind of right so was there anything else, any other signs that you experienced, any other things that you experienced in your relationship that went from that super attention? What were those signs that gradually changed? There was another very important sign that I, tend, I did overlook, which was um, when no one's, you know, when everyone stopped calling and messaging and stuff. And, you know, it was a good point to say, no one cares about you. See, no one's messaging. No one, no one's calling. I'm the only person who really cares about you. Where are your friends now? You know? And it didn't strike me that I was actually isolating myself. And it had reached a point where he would tell uh, people that I was dependent on him and I could do anything on my own. And she, she's, she'll flounder without me. Oh, look at me floundering now. I'm really floundering. So when we act, when the relationship actually ended and um, I, I got a career and uh, everyone was very upset, including him. He was very upset. Like, is she supposed to be dependent on me and how is she doing so well for herself? You know, that kind of thing. So they, uh, I, I should have, I should have just looked at that red flag and you know walked away right then. But that will come in the next, in the next part. Yeah. Over the next. Yeah, and also part of grooming. I'm just thinking of this from the top of my head. I didn't have it in my notes, but that uh, it happens a lot. It doesn't happen. Speaking of you know, she, I'm supposed to take care of her and she's supposed to depend on me kind of line of conversation. When a partner tells the other, I will take care of you. I don't, you don't need to work. I don't want you to work. And that is a big red flag. As wonderful as that sounds, you don't have to work. I'll provide for you unless this is my opinion. Like there's nothing wrong with that. As long as that person who is asking you to stay home and not work as long as that person puts in place a financial stability for you regardless of what happens because if something happens to the one who's demanding that you stay home <laughs> or not work uh, something has to be set legally that you are financially okay if something happens to that person or if, if or if that person leaves you or if that person abuses you and then you leave so you need to make sure that your life is not compromised, your future is not compromised, your financial stability is not compromised if someone is demanding or asking you or sweet-talking you into, 
I will treat you. I will take care of you. You will never need anything. Okay. If that's what you want me to do, fine. But you have to give me the guarantees. Because that is often used as a means to to slowly control you because then you don't have access to finances. Then when you don't have access to that, you don't have, even if you're given a certain amount, you're still dependent on this one person. And now you become the property of that person. You become dependent on that person. You become slave of that person. I had that experience in my first marriage where I was only given, I was not supposed to work, not allowed to have a career. I managed to get a little, uh, jobs here and there but only because I begged and I I I really worked hard to get those but I could I wasn't allowed to have a career like a you know like a regular job and and he would not give me any money except for groceries money so and it took a long time before I could actually start getting those jobs because I was a stay-at-home mom and um yeah so if I need a pair of shoes I would have to ask permission can I have money to buy shoes and it'd be yes or no you know <laughs> it's like do you really need them don't you have enough shoes I'm like well, you know so that kind of thing so you want to make sure that if if you're in a relationship and your partner is you know is offering to support you financially 100 make sure that everything is in place before you say yes that you are taking care of financially in the long term and actually I was um I saw something earlier this morning where uh, about a woman who was asking her husband wants to, wants to have kids and she is demanding that while she is on maternity leave I'm guess I'm not sure what this is me being the U.S. because I believe they don't pay maternity leave there if you if you go on maternity maybe in some companies they don't but so she is she's she is uh, requesting that her husband pays her while she's on maternity leave because to take care of the kid because that chunk of time when she goes back to work she loses money otherwise into her pension plan right while he's still making money so it'd be interesting to see how that pans out technically you'd want the company to be able to give maternity leave but where that is not available if you know if the two don't agree on having kids and the one spouse wants to have it demands to have a kid then you got to make sure that the other person is taken care of financially for the long term not just for the short term but talking about jobs i mean uh, i did have one job and uh, invariably he would i don't know somehow the other make make me late for work and every day i would be going to work at least 10 to 20 minutes late because just as I would leave for work and I was on my way out, he would be like, hey, but you haven't made my breakfast yet. He said, don't leave without making my breakfast. And I would have to rush back and quickly make his breakfast and tell him, okay, it's on the kitchen counter and rush out for work and um, invariably always miss the bus and end up getting 10 to 20 minutes late and my boss was nice enough to keep me for a whole year and then very diplomatically said, uh, we'd like to keep you for the whole day for the same salary. And I was like, that wouldn't be possible. So it was a very amicable uh, kind of agreement that I wasn't going to be working anymore. And later on, I did tell him what actually was going on. Another friend of mine also had spoken to him about the same thing. And... Uh, then he was like, okay, when he when we met after um, after the divorce was filed, and he was like, hey, you know what? I totally get what you're going through. And it never struck me to ask you if everything at home was all right. So, so question, question for you. I, I have a question for you, actually, two questions. Two questions. When did that, <laughs> when when did he start expecting you to make breakfast? Because I'm pretty sure he didn't ask you to make breakfast right away. Um, I day think one? right. Yeah, no, not from day one because uh, we were late risers when we first got married. So the making of breakfast thing happened about a couple of years after the marriage. So it's like you know what we should have. We should start our day with a proper breakfast. And uh, I was I was making breakfast for the both of us 
from day one. So that was, um, and I accepted it. I mean, that was fine with me. But then when I got a job and I had to be and work at a certain time, I was giving him my entire paycheck. And I expected that he would make his breakfast as well. And, you know, if I'm contributing financially, then he should be contributing at home too. But I was doing everything at home. What would so, have happened if he had said no? Did you ever say no? Actually, um, I, I stopped making his breakfast um, after my leg, after I um, fractured and dislocated my ankle. And um, I had to have surgery. We'll talk about that in one of our later videos. That's another important thing. Um, and that was when I just drew lines. I started drawing lines from that, from that moment once, I mean, it was, it was quite a nightmare and I was like, no, just no, not gonna happen. And from that time on, we started making our own breakfast. So it was like, if I'm, if I'm contributing financially, I, there are certain things that you need to do as well. You know, you can't expect a 70, 30 way, you know, both of us are contributing financially, but I'm doing all the housework and I was juggling three jobs at that time. So juggling three jobs and handling a house, it was just insane. And all he did was just contribute financially and that was it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's a huge thing. Yeah. Okay. So for the, for this particular episode, uh, for this particular conversation on grooming, um, the transition from love bombing to abuse, just to wrap it up, it happens slowly. It's little things. And that's where we need to pay attention, right? And also the one thing that abusers do in that transition is they will test you a little bit. They will see how far they can go. And if they get away with a little one, they will push again next time with a bit more and a bit more and a bit more. And, and what happens with that, often we go into denial because we go back to how amazing it has been and we justify that little bit. And then before you know it, you find yourself deep into this abusive relationship. Maybe not physically, but it's still abusive and it's quite damaging to your mental health. So it's very important to pay attention to what is actually happening? What is the conversation? And when something, when you're being pushed, question it. If you're being asked to, like Charmaine, if, if you're being asked to make breakfast when you're, you have to run to work, you're running late, and the other person can very easily make breakfast on their own, that's a big red flag right there. Because then that person it doesn't love you as much as they say they do. Because if they love you, they're going to be there and they're going to do everything for you to support you in every way not just by saying it, but to actually be doing it. So do you want to one add second. anything to that? Yes, I forgot one small point. At that point when I was making his breakfast and he was making me late for work, we had a friend staying with us. So um, I, we were actually helping a friend out at that time. So I had to make breakfast for him as well. So I had to make two breakfasts, not just one. So it was a little difficult and I couldn't really go to work and tell my boss, I got late because as I was walking out the door, my husband wanted to make breakfast for him and a guy who was, who we were helping out. I would Okay, have so what's the lesson in that? If that, if you were in a relationship again and your partner said that to you now, what would you say? I'm late for work. I need my job. I think you're capable of making your own breakfast. See you by lunchtime. Exactly. So there you go. Stand firm. <laughs> it's a nice thing to be able to do that. But when it's demanded and it jeopardizes what you're supposed to be doing, that's a big no-no. So it's a, it's a gigantic red flag. So, okay. So we're going to wrap, uh, wrap it up here for this episode. And what we'll do is if you are experiencing some form of abuse if you're not even sure you're not clear uh, please reach out to us uh, or you can go to the resources in the comments a lot in, in the comments in the description 
there will be links there to resources that you can reach out to in your country. And there's some free downloadable brochures. You don't need to put your email or anything. You just get direct access. So we don't need your information. You're totally, totally anonymous. So there you go. Uh, hopefully this has been helpful and we'll see you next time. Bye for now. Thank you.